potential. Something that the Pokemon franchise has in spades. Two decades, more than 800 Pokemon, countless memories from the games or the anime. They've impacted many of our childhoods, mine as well. However, over the years, dissatisfaction among the fanbase has risen. As both a longtime fan and competitive player myself, I think some of those criticisms are valid. Regardless, I still believe that Pokemon is one of the absolute best in regards to monster and character design, world building, and much more. Unfortunately, many people, including myself, consider most of these aspects to be too surface level. Little of its brilliant world building and well thought out concepts are integrated closely into the experience, which makes all of this wasted potential. Instead, it's a rinse and repeat process of the same formula with a relatively weak narrative compared to other JRPGs, something that even the anime fell victim to until recently. But what if there was something that actually made use out of all these elements, that not only makes use of them but adds much more, which is equally complemented by its storytelling, battles, character work, and continuity, with multiple protagonists that age, all the while maintaining the same Pokemon world feel that we all know and love? Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Deuzy Gunner, and allow me to introduce you all to Pokemon Adventures. Pokemon Adventures is an ongoing manga series that began serialization in 1997, written by the brilliant author Hidenori Kusaka, and illustrated by Mato and now Satoshi Yamamoto. Its original and Japanese name is known as Pokemon Special, with international fans referring to it mostly as Pokespin. It currently spans over 70 volumes with separate arcs for each released mainline game. It already has a very loyal following, and even has been acknowledged by the creator of Pokemon, Satoshi Tajiri, who's gone on to mention that this manga is the closest thing to his original vision, as well as with the president of the Pokemon company, Tsunekazu Ishihara, saying that he wants every Pokemon fan to read this. As of this video, I've currently read up until the end of the Emerald Arc, which is considered to be the finale of all the previous arcs up until the point. So that is going to be the extent of what I'm going to cover on this particular video, and a few other ones in the future, until I catch up, that is. The world and region designs are adapted faithfully to the games, while also being given new life through creative and detailed artwork, especially noticeable in the Ruby and Sapphire arc, in my opinion. The same can be said regarding the presentation of the Pokémon as well. While Twilight Wings receives a lot of praise for being able to integrate the Pokémon into everybody's daily lives, and justifiably so, Pokemon Adventures has been way ahead of its time in that regard. Not only that, but these said Pokemon are much more true to their game counterparts in the sense that they don't just yell out their names, but stay true to their animalistic cries, along with their Pokedex entries, which I'll go into soon. Regardless, while the region and characters are the same, they're presented much more differently. For one, the Pokedex isn't just given to everybody like a charity case, but instead, considered as one of the most important devices due to the information it has regarding the Pokemon, that is only given to trainers which the professor himself finds worthy, with some exceptions here and there. Now while this may seem like an unnecessary detail, the manga does a phenomenal job at emphasizing on its importance. How you may ask? Through the Pokemon battles, as well as the prominent theme of fate. To say that the way Pokemon battles play out are different from both the games and the anime is a massive understatement. As in, the trainers are very much a part of the battle itself. Instead of being relegated to just throwing out their Pokemon and giving commands, they make strategies that involve them taking action, which depending on how well they execute it, decides the tide of the battle. In this way, it becomes a literal case of both the trainer and their Pokemon working directly together to best their opposition. To create something which they individually wouldn't be able to do, the trainer also being a pivotal part of how the battle plays out adds a lot more potential towards a dynamic, action-packed, fast-paced offense which Pokemon Adventures does almost picture perfectly. This is especially emphasized on in the battles that take place between the protagonists and the villains, where the objective involves trying to incapacitate the trainers as well. Here, it becomes a literal case of life and death, which I feel becomes the best catalyst towards testing and showcasing exactly just how strong the bond and chemistry is between the Pokémon and its trainers. Obviously because of this, the battles are bound to be more intense. 
However, one misconception that gets thrown around a lot is that the manga is too brutal or edgy, with the picture of the decapitated Arbog being used as a reference point. This scene from Red and Blue in particular is infamous among new readers and gives both them and potential readers the impression that there's going to be a lot of death and blood as such, when clearly that's not the case. For while the manga does have occasional blood, it is still essentially a children's manga in regards to Naruto or One Piece standards, even though I'd say it's even lesser than that. It is darker than the Pokemon anime and games, yes, but outside of the franchise, it's just a rather decent quality manga for kids and teens. The same franchise that two generations back had a main antagonist that wanted to commit worldwide genocide. Just saying. This is something that I'll go more in depth into later on. But for now though, just take it from me that calling this manga edgy or dark is like having a live adaptation of Dora the Explorer. Wait, what do you mean it exists? Anyways, back to the point at hand, all of these concepts do very much sound great on paper. But surely there needs to be a foundation for all these battles, right? Well, what if I were to tell you that there is just that, and that it's existed since every Pokemon game up until now? That's right, folks, I'm talking about the Pokédex. Specifically, the Pokédex entries for the Pokemon. Here, the Pokédex entries are very much taken literally and are applied to the Pokémon themselves, both regarding how they naturally act in the wild and especially what they're capable of in the battle. Now, I like to consider myself as someone who's considered a great chunk of action-oriented series. However, in all my years, which means absolutely nothing since I'm only 22 years old, I have never seen this many battles on a constant basis that each time left me in absolute shock. And the fact that all of this is built upon the foundation of these Pokédex entries entirely is something that continues to leave me in absolute awe. Take for example the time when Faulkner ended up going against Johto's legendary trio in Suicune, Raikou, and Entei. With his go-to Pokemon being a Skarmory, Faulkner is at an immediate disadvantage here. This eventually leads to a certain portion of Skarmory's metallic feathers breaking at the hands of Suicune. So what did he do? He took those fallen feathers from Skarmory and used them as a weapon by combining it with his Pokeballs, turning it into boomerangs against Suicune, immediately turning the tide of the battle and coming very close to catching the legendary beast. All because of its Pokedex entries, which says that its fallen feathers possess the strength and sharpness of a knife, which directly coincides with both its crystal and emerald Pokedex entry. Another perfect example is during the Ruby and Sapphire arc, when Sapphire, aka the female protagonist, is in a cable car with Flannery, going against Team Aqua admin Matt. Here, Matt puts Sapphire in a precarious position by flooding that cable car with water, where he is able to breathe thanks to his Azumarill who, as per its Pokédex entry, can help someone breathe underwater through the balloons it can naturally make. He then sends out his Sharpedo to finish her off, where Sapphire is forced to defend herself by bringing out her Lairon and using Iron Defense, which with the type advantage stops the Sharpedo dead in its tracks and have its fangs broken. That doesn't work because, as per Sharpedo's Pokédex entry in Ruby, its fangs are known to immediately grow back, putting Sapphire at a stalemate. With nothing left to do, it appears that only Doom awaits both her and Flannery. But just when you think there's nothing she can do, she ends up using those sharp fangs that fell from Sharpedo's onslaught and uses it to break the windows in the flooded cable car, helping her finally breathe again and turn the tide of the battle. These details are something that I obviously skimmed over when playing the games, because this was just a simple element with absolutely no substance whatsoever. In the manga, however, this is integrated. This has purpose. This actually means something, which elevates these scenes so much in my eyes. And as a longtime fan of this franchise, it left me pleasantly surprised. Something that I honestly haven't seen get replicated anywhere, including the anime. All of this ends up elevating the Pokédex and its importance on a whole new level, as now it's no longer an encyclopedia of trivial information, but a device to formulate strategies by the Pokédex holders for the battles or when they're under attack. Brilliant, I tell you. Now that I'm done talking about these things, I think it's time I spoke about the characters as well as the stories. And do they deliver? Nope. They go above and beyond. The protagonists for each arc are the manga versions of the playable characters from the Pokemon games, as well as two original characters from Kanto and Hoenn's third versions. And let me be the first person to mention that while they were silent blank slates in the games that were meant to be an extension of yourself, that couldn't be further from the case here. For the cast of characters have full-fledged personalities with unique traits and their own stories. Protagonists that specialize and excel in one specific element regarding Pokemon and combine it with their natural skills. For example, the first protagonist, Red, is said to possess a natural knack and understanding for battling and constantly trains in that specific skills, unlike another protagonist like, say, Crystal, who specializes in catching Pokemon, whose throws are always a sure hit through her kicking the Pokeballs, as if she's playing soccer. 
Details like this, along with the story events, do a wonderful job at showcasing just how naturally talented they are in their specializations. This also does act as the ground for the stories turning out different because guess what? Not all of these protagonists want to beat all the gym leaders and become the champion. They instead have their own goals and purpose, which means that from the yellow arc, the whole formula for how the story pans out changes. A perfect illustration of this point would have to be Ruby, who despite being the son of Norman, shows from the start of the story that he wants to stay as far away from battling, preferring to instead groom his Pokemon so that they can compete in and win contests. All of this has context behind it too, which makes for some really fine storytelling. That said, these special talents don't define the whole characters because there is much more to them, for none of them from what I've seen so far are overly cliché for the sake of relatability. Instead, the focus is placed on their journeys, beginning as flawed characters with plenty of room for growth, both as trainers and as people. Events throughout the stories act as catalysts towards helping us viewers empathize more with these characters, which I feel is a much more effective method towards good storytelling. Something that I think other franchises could learn from regarding their protagonist. Looking at you, Fire Emblem! For example, let's talk about Green. I'll call her Blue because that's what I got introduced to her as, and that's her original name. She was the scrap female protagonist that was promoted in Kensugomori's art. While she did eventually make her debut in Fire Red and Leaf Green, Pokemon Adventures is where she made her first actual appearance. And let me tell you right now just how great of a character she is. See, she makes her debut in the middle of Red's journey and immediately establishes herself as a clever con artist. Showing her playful and flirtish side, she was able to both fluster and deceive Red, selling him useless items before going on her way. This becomes a common theme throughout the majority of the Red and Blue arc, as while she would show every now and then that she wasn't all that bad, it is very much established how flawed her character is. Stealing her starter from Professor Oak's lab, constantly scamming others, prioritizing herself in desperate situations, so much so to the point that she had no problem leaving Red to do things all by himself, despite working together beforehand, it all shows that she's an antithesis of a main Pokemon character. Despite all of that, she is considered a massive fan favorite due to her clever nature, which allows her to always think on her feet and rationally assess the situation, using whatever it is at her disposal to find her way out. This clever side of her, which along with her very brash personality, has easily made her an enjoyable character to see. It's only by the end of the Red and Blue arc that she starts growing as a person, with the future arcs being a culmination of her growth along with her whole backstory, which not just explains everything about her but adds even more to her character. Something that I'll be revealing in a future video. Please subscribe. Which brings me to my next point. See, Blue already has a solid base to stand on and cement her character, but if there had to be something that immortalizes her along with the other Pokédex holders, it would have to be their own Pokémon. Or if there's any proper way to describe them, it would have to be an extension of their trainers. Take for example Blue's Ditto. This is a Pokémon that's notorious for being able to transform into anything, including humans. While Blue's special talent is something else entirely, one of her main specialities is deception. Whether it be the time it helped her disguise herself as Sabrina, who by the way is a Team Rocket admin, more on that in future videos, to infiltrate the Silph Co building they took over, to even deceiving her opponent by thinking they cut her arm off, when it was just a ditto pretending to be that said arm all along, it very much goes hand in hand with selling her character even more to the masses. The same can be said for some of the evil team's Pokemon, which perfectly sells the narrative of the intimate connection between trainer and Pokemon. In other words, they complete their characters and elevate one another. Now for the final segment of the video, let's talk about some of the things that make this manga so special to me. No pun intended. See, the whole premise of Pokemon revolves around a prodigy of a child, journeying around the region, collecting badges, beating bad guys, and eventually becoming the champion. The concept is considered unbelievable by many as the bare minimum is done with it in the game. Here in the manga, however, it is made believable because the main characters are sold as prodigies. Not just with how they battle, but how they adapt during these serious situations. Obviously in such a dynamic style, a kid's not gonna beat a grown man in a fist fight. So instead, the focus is put on these characters outsmarting their opponent, in a way that actually makes sense, that rarely ever involves overpowering through brute force or the overdone power of friendship cliché. Yes, that does play a factor, but it is just one piece of the puzzle. And the best part is that these creative approaches are explained and in a non-intrusive way, making the experience much more enjoyable for me. What immortalizes these battles for me, however, is the focus that's put on making moments, 
For every Goku and Vegeta taking their stance on the deserted land, or Rock Lee taking his weights off, there is always an emphasis on making scenes which fans can look fondly back at. Something that the artist who started drawing for the manga from the middle of the gold, silver, and crystal arc, Satoshi Yamamoto, does in spades. The level of attention he puts in the expression of the characters, the scenery, the poses, all of it is a testament to his phenomenal ability. Back to the topic at hand though, that is not to say the protagonists always win, as despite them being sold as Gen 1 prodigies, the same exact case can be set for the villains, who very much show why they're worthy of that stature on many situations. So what is it exactly that retains the Pokemon world feel that we're used to? Well, it'd have to be the fact that despite all of this, Kusaka does a perfect job at keeping a healthy balance of everything, and he does that through the character interactions and the humor. He uses the two elements as the catalyst towards making the characters shine and give readers the enjoyment of reading their story, with both Mato and Yamamoto illustrating it perfectly with their art. One of the main themes around Pokemon has always been retaining the feel of having an enjoyable journey, a journey full of memories instead of facing a constant uphill battle. They make perfect use of that to retain the same feel that I've been familiar with since I was a kid, while slowly getting more invested in these main characters, recognizing that while they still have ways to go before maturing, they are still good people. People I genuinely want nothing but the best for. The main villains of the stories are also handled very well I believe, as not only are they treated as actual threats for everyone to be careful of, but many of them are also very fleshed out as well. There were many occasions where I thought I was looking at a generic evil bad guy with absolutely no substance to him whatsoever, but as those stories progressed, I understood that it was a subversion the whole time, that despite them being villains, they are still human beings. To give you a basic idea, the same villain I once thought was an overpowered characterless scumbag made me cry for him at the very end of the story. The level of subversion is a constant theme throughout their stories and is what made the experience so unpredictable for me. Because just when I think where I know everything's going, I'm thrown a massive curveball. The exact same case can be applied to the other characters too, for the gym leaders are fleshed out much more and are recurring figures that exist beyond just handing badges to the trainers but are responsible for the region's safety. The biggest surprise however is that this includes the side characters as well. Normally in the anime, Ash and his traveling companions would meet a new face each episode which leads to them doing something together before it all ends with them saying goodbye in that exact same episode, never to be seen ever again. It's a rinse and repeat process that's very much run its course and even now is a problem that continues to persist I feel. That is not the case here. These side characters also become recurring figures throughout the protagonist's journey that do play a role in influencing their growth as characters or adding to the entertainment, creating a proper sense of familiarity and kinship. This was especially prevalent in Ruby and Sapphire, where the two interviewers who battle a couple of times also play a part in the story. Hell, even the trick master of all people does something. The best part about it all though is the fact that character relationships actually exist, that span way across one's occupation or what region they're from. And it all has an influence on the events that play out, which only serves to add more to the world building and the storytelling experience. All of this and many more is why I consider Pokemon Adventures as the best version of Pokemon. For it truly makes the use of its infinite potential that this franchise has and does so in such a way where people of all ages can read it and find genuine enjoyment out of it. I cannot recommend this masterpiece enough and would highly implore you to give this one a chance. For it is Pokemon at its full potential. There are many more things that I want to say of course, but this video has honestly gone on for long enough. I've noticed how despite the level of fanfare it has in Japan, there are not enough videos about it for the international audience which show them just how great the manga can really be. That my friends is an injustice to its quality and one that I won't stand for. Which brings me to my announcement. Moving forward, I'm going to be making videos that cover these arcs and its pivotal moments in all its glory for you guys to see. So if you are excited for that, feel free to subscribe and like this video so that more can know about the masterpiece that is Pokemon Adventures. And no, also because I want my channel to grow. Please. But anyways, I do very much hope that you guys are looking forward to this. My name is DUZ Gunner. Thank you very much for watching. Have yourselves a glorious day. And I'll see you all on the flip side. Push.